The Man in Line with Andy Wint. Fast am I. Good afternoon. Welcome to Man in Line on Manx Radio. Here we are, Monday 29th of January, the last Monday in January 2024. Halfway through the Canon administration, we're heading around all the constituencies, just talking to uh, the two MHKs representing each constituency. What have we learned so far? What do we know? What's going to happen in the future? Well, Douglas East MHKs. Claire Barber was elected for a second term in 2021 and Joni Farragher for her first in September 2021. So, uh, Faster Mike, good afternoon. Welcome to you both. Faster Mike, Andy. Faster Mike, Andy. Good to see you. Good to see you. So, uh, Joni Farragher, I mean, first time as an MHK. If you'd known then what you know now, would you still have done it? <laughs> what a question to open with. Um, yes, I would have, because I think that the the politics that I bring are kind of what the island needs. However, I think if I could go back to the start of the term and put into my head what I have in my head now, I think that would be really helpful for me. <laughs> Interesting, because uh, you know many people say they'd like to become MHKs. How long did it take you to get up to speed? Did anybody mentor you or did you just pick it up as you went along? Well, it, there, there is a, the expectation that you will pick it up as you go along. And um, I think for me, I've fed back that I think it would have been helpful to have more of a sort of mental system. Or um, more, the, I have to say, by the way, the clerk's office do provide um, CPD continuously, as well as uh, provide a sort of intro week with lots of um, really, really good and relevant training sessions on there. Um, but I think I felt that, that more help in the department, for example, or around how the department's work and contacts, etc., would have been really useful um, in the first instance to cut out a lot of work and make it a bit more efficient. OK. Uh, and second time around for, for Claire Barber. Um, and, and again, what does the second term bring? What does oh, the experience, know-how? I think, as Joni said, it's that ability to know, I suppose, who to go to when something goes wrong, um, or you've got a query, you've got something you want to find out. Um, if you don't know the right relevant person, you can often feel you're going around the houses just instead of the person you're trying to represent or trying to solve something for. So being able to know exactly where to go is definitely a bonus. Um, and I think, you know, there will always be some change internally within departments, but as a general rule, if you know the roles, you can find the right people. So I had that as a benefit, absolutely. Um, but, uh, you know, I still go to the CPD sessions. I think anyone who thinks they don't still have things to learn is probably missing something as they go along. You know, uh, as much as I'd like to share information, if I can, that I've managed to garner equally, I absolutely am always learning from others. And I think in this role, there'll always be someone who's come across something that you're now going through. Um, and you can often share advice and, and uh, experience without sharing any information so you know we've always got to be conscious we're not sharing personal details but actually if you just understand the scenarios often there's someone who's been there and trodden those paths before that can really unlock the doors a bit quicker for you interesting you mentioned and data protection is something that's come in certainly in the past 10 years or so how difficult is it to, to tiptoe around data protection i think it is hard and i think one of the biggest frustrations is there is an expectation when people email us that automatically we can then take that information and just get the solutions with the information whereas actually we have to seek their permission if it's not explicitly given to be able to then go and share that in other directions otherwise I'll try and do it anonymously but there's a limit to how far you can get if all you're sharing is a principle of a situation as opposed to the specifics and that person's information that they can then go and dig in to see what's happened and equally of course a department will need explicit consent in order to share information about that person so we, we do I, I regularly get um, queries with regards to say for example social security and they would like me to liaise on their behalf but I need their explicit consent or the social security division rightfully of course can't um, release the information about that person or explain rationale behind decisions without that written consent. Uh, what's the constituency workload like, uh, Joni? It's it, it 
it's fairly it, it's up and down but um it's 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 fairly constant and uh, in terms of how many hours you'd have to put in i tend to put aside at least a day per week i try to make it a friday when i do constituency visits or deal with constituency emails um i think you could um spend you know all day every day doing and it's the same with a lot of the roles in this in, in this particular job you could kind of they they are endless they they really do kind of keep opening up the more the more you do um so yeah it's it's a good workload without compromising work. anybody's data typically what sort of stuff will you get um queries about oh it's so wide ranging um it could be i mean yeah without sharing any personal details at the moment i'm dealing with um housing issues so um, that's trying to liaise with uh, private landlords um, and um, I, in fact I won't go into any more detail but that, that kind of issue comes up quite a lot. Um, often social housing is a big issue that people will contact MHKs about um, access to benefits so av- availability of information on that and um, of course parking mm-hmm. and issues around parking kind of sit in several different categories themselves so so that that is such a such a big one that we deal with. What sort of, of parking? What sort of problems? So, for example, um, the first of all, the pressures of parking. So the the fact that there aren't enough spaces for the amount of cars that there are in our constituency. Um, but secondly, the boundaries of disc zones is quite a big issue that repeatedly crops up. So um, Claire and I have liaised about this, and we know that both of us receive uh, fairly similar and constant um, correspondence about this. That the natural boundaries of the disc zone tend to lie a little bit further out and we have you know asked the the doi to undertake a review of that so that they could actually establish where the disc the the disc zone boundary might lie more naturally and more in alignment with people's needs it's fair to uh, to say that uh, douglas east has got its uh, its uh, fair share of apartments claire barber Uh, so you must get a an indication of what the rental market's like at the moment Uh, how how is it standing and, and what about people people's ability to pay and to make their way nowadays? So, I mean, there's, there's unquestionably challenges around housing, and I think that's a, across the island. And as you say, Douglas East has a lot of, well, it actually has a really broad range of properties. We've got everything from the, you know, £4 million luxury homes to some of the, the lowest uh, sort of one-room uh, rentals that you would find on the island. It's a that's really broad a, mix. It, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, and they, they come in all, all sorts of uh, standards, I think it would be reasonable to say. So, um, certainly, I I know that uh, I've, over the years, I've been representing Douglas East, um, supported a number of people who've had challenges with their property, whether that be supporting them through environmental health, whether that be supporting them um, with with accessing funds towards heating, for example. There really is a, a broad spectrum and also supporting them in, in knowing what their rights are, because um, in some cases people will be evicted. But actually, when you look at the letter of the, the law, um, they have significantly more rights than they might be aware of. Um, and some of it is simply about that awareness, making sure they know who they can go to to get on boots on the ground support because it's also knowing where the limits of what we can and can't do are and that's tricky because sometimes there are people who desperately need support and they've they've reached out they've made that initial you know cry for help and they just don't have the energy to go to the person they actually need to go to and so trying to bring those pieces together can sometimes take a lot of time because it's really important that people actually are able to access the things that they're entitled to um but housing is unquestionably a challenge we you know I certainly am hearing of people who are finding that their you know the end of their their tenancy is coming up. It's not going to be um, renewed, and of course, finding somewhere at the bottom end of the market um, to the mid range at the minute is is nigh on impossible. Well, I've had a couple of messages about this. Michaela asked uh, a, a similar question to that, but also uh, this is WhatsApp six zero eight saying, "Can you ask uh, Claire and Joni uh, what, what what's happening to help young families find a home? The rental market is impossible." If you have a child and pets, what's happened as regards providing affordable housing? So many sites that we have, the prison, Park Road School. Why isn't the government building some houses, Joni? Well, it's a great question, and thank you to the person who sent that in. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to sort of talk maybe briefly about the Poverty um, Committee's most recent report, which has only just been put on the Register of Business, and it's a, a report on housing. So it's got 32 recommendations in there that hopefully um, the Council of Ministers are yet to submit their, their response, of course, and that w- will be debated in the April Timwald. Uh, but those 32 recommendations are aimed at um, the 
type of people that Michaela has asked about there. So um, it's obviously the poverty committee, so it's aimed at people on um, lower incomes, but it's equally looking at the issue as a whole and trying to actually address what the root causes are of what people identified as a housing crisis in the 2021 general election campaigns. Um, we have listeners to Man in Line all over the world. The podcast is listened to here, there and everywhere. And many people, particularly people listening live across now, will be saying poverty committee on the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man is full of enigmatic millionaires who are trying to figure <laughs> out which bottle of Chablis to have for lunch. <laughs> oh, so, oh, that it were. I mean, I think we all know that there are pockets of deprivation uh, across the island, just as there are there absolutely a, everywhere. There it, is an underclass, isn't there? I mean, there, there are people who are hemmed in through circumstance in poverty. Absolutely. And in I think in almost every constituency, there is a fairly large um, social housing uh, estate of people who are obviously on low incomes and who are potentially vulnerable to, for other uh, for other reasons as well. And those people matter as much as everybody else in our society and I think that's why we've come up with the Poverty Committee in the first instance which was in the last administration and why Tim will voted not only to keep the Poverty Committee in this administration but to actually expand its membership up to five people so it has five members now instead of just the three showing how uh, Tim will's commitment I think to actually getting a, a more inclusive and equitable island. What's going to happen? What's going to be done about poverty Joni? Well, so first, let's just talk about the, the report, for because the, the first recommendation in the report, um, which I think is really important, actually tasks the Council of Ministers to produce an action plan to ip- implement the recommendations of the previous Poverty Committee's reports. Now... I just kind of want to lay a marker down now that that action plan will be scrutinised very robustly. Um, we don't bring recommendations in order for them, in order for any minister to say this has already been undertaken, we will maintain the status quo and we think that answers the recommendation. That's not what we're bringing recommendations for. We're bringing recommendations to actually affect tangible change. So that that is the marker that I would lay down right here for that recommendation. Council of Ministers have been asked to produce an action plan to implement the recommendations of previous poverty committee reports, which should mean that we see tangible action to actually address in, uh, inequality and poverty on the island. Okay, and uh, Claire Barber, let's just come back to the prison, to Park Road. Uh, People will see those brownfield sites sitting there. Absolutely (laughs) nothing happened uh, for years and years and years. And if there is a housing shortage, why doesn't somebody somewhere, whether it's the private sector or the public sector or the public sector enabling the private sector, why can't something be done? Why can't we get more houses and apartments built? So some of it's around the way that government disposes of land. And I think it's incredibly frustrating often actually so we know that those sites have been I suppose for want of a better word relinquished they're not currently in use Um, then what happens is other departments um, have the opportunity to say whether they think their sites they need for things that they want to to put in place so whether that be um, education looking at school provision whether that be the um, Department of Home Affairs looking at um, the, the blue light hub concept and feasibility studies and until they're confident that they're not going to use them they won't then release them for something else to happen now I understand why that needs to happen I think we would also be just as criticised if we were to sell those sites off or or develop them and then suddenly find we didn't have something for another project that we need Um, but I think there is something around us trying to speed that process up so that those sites don't sit for the length of time that they are at the minute Um, and we know that there's both um, public sites in Douglas East and also a huge number of private sites that are sitting as undeveloped brownfield sites and obviously there is um, the island infrastructure scheme that's looking to try and uh, nurture some some progress in that regard Um, but all of those things take time and you know, as much as we can put uh, incentives in place, I it's not for government to do everything. I think you know the Manx Development Corporation work has been um, really positive actually in regard to what they're doing with the old nurses home, and obviously there's the work around Westmoreland Village, and that's a, a live planning application. Um, which I won't be hearing the appeal for, so I'm slightly more comfortable talking about that one. Um, you know, but there is abso- absolutely a need to put uh, put accommodation in. Now, that's that is looking at the affordable market for accommodation. I think that's the right area we should be looking. But the the, the compromise position, um, and that will be obviously for for planning to determine, is that there is a challenge then around parking, and we know that that's been one of the biggest pushbacks for the people in the area. Although we we acknowledge pretty much everything you would need is walking distance from that site 
the reality is we anticipate some people will have cars. That is a, you know, an unavoidable uh, fact, I suppose. Um, and we see that across Douglas East where we've had old townhouses converted to three flats or maybe five rooms, whatever it might be. And then you end up with three, five vehicles where maybe historically you'd have had one and then the knock-on is they're just, as Joni said, there is not enough parking. So you've got to try and look at all of that in the in the round, try and put in infrastructure that perhaps allows electric um, electric bikes to be charged, things that might allow people to make conscious choices away from cars. But I think we always have to acknowledge there will be vehicles and that is unavoidable. OK, we're with Douglas East MHKs today, Joni Farragher and Claire Barber. Stephen, you're live with the Douglas East MHKs. Good afternoon, Andy. Good afternoon, Douglas East MHKs. And good afternoon, listeners. Good afternoon. What, what I would like to ask, to, to Charlie, thank you for that greeting. Uh, what I'd like to ask is, um, it was interesting to see that there was a result from the South MHKs uh, working as a team and getting a result for their area over the school and the swimming pool. Now, what I'd like to ask is, uh, I'm sure you will both be aware that there is overcrowding problems, repair and maintenance problems in schools in Douglas area. And uh, should Douglas MHKs act more as a unit together to seek improvements and uh, and benefits for the school? Because I know that, uh, I believe that some of our schools, certainly close to your area, are very overcrowded. There's, there's uh, uh, quarter cabins for classrooms. There's maintenance that is sadly lacking. Maurice Road, I believe, needs assistance. Uh, the last time I was in St. Ninian's for the hustings, the last election, there was obviously remedial work needed in the main hall there. And it appears that maintenance is missing. We've, uh, we, I know you spoke just a few moments ago about Park Road. And Park Road uh, is earmarked for a new school to solve some of this uh, overcrowding but so my question is should you work more collaboratively with your fellow Douglas MHKs to seek some of these uh, some of these solutions because I know that schooling is probably not as exciting as some other issues but it's vital for uh, for the future okay Johnny Farragher so, Yes, thanks for your question. I absolutely agree how, how vital it is as well. I fully agree with that. Um, I take your point that we should work more collaboratively and um, and actually, you know, do accept that. But I just um, would like to sort of maybe update you. I've got a couple of questions in for Keys next week, actually, on this exact issue and school overcrowding and um, more just looking at what sites have been identified. I had a written question in about the Park Road site about this time last year, um, which said that there would be further updates and that they were still... the Department of Education was still actively working with stakeholders to identify a site so I'm obviously seeking an update on that and looking at wh- where we are up to with identifying a site for a two form entry school um, with reference to the fact that as you've said there there is overcrowding issues in the schools and I do um, receive emails about that um, so yeah I, I do take your point though that the, sh- that the collaborative working that the southern um, MHKs undertook recently was, was super effective uh, Claire Barber yeah hi Steve Good afternoon. Um, I, I would agree with Joni. Um, I, I should declare an interest. I've got uh, children in Douglas schools, um, and my my oldest has just gone to Balakameen, and there's no question, you know, that there's a huge number of children within the school. Um, and I know he came home with ideas for you know, projects of things we could fundraise for the school because there's maintenance that does need doing, and they're aware of it. So I think there's always a, a concerted push around making sure that the maintenance budgets are in the right place, making sure they're they're being used but I suppose one of the other challenge we have is we don't necessarily see the the bigger picture across all of the school estates to be able to make that prioritisation decision so it's absolutely incumbent on us to work not just even with Douglas MHKs because actually the boundaries of schools don't yeah. don't actually always match those clearly defined constituency areas it's actually wider than that but I absolutely take your point I think we can always work better with other colleagues Stephen? Um, 
Well, I, I, I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. I, I do hope you can work more collaboratively. I do think that's the way forward. And sadly, it's uh, it's a fact that political pressure is brought by the number of votes that you can bring to bear. And uh, and sadly, sometimes you've got to accept that you're elected to fight for what's best, A, for your area, and B, for the island nationally. OK. All right, Stephen, I appreciate that. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, and, excuse me, on that subject, Claire Barber, uh, you are a member of Comin. Uh, does anything ever cut across your responsibility to constituents from what happens in in uh, your ministerial portfolio? Yeah, so it does. And I mean, the way the government code set out allows us to act on behalf of our constituents, which is absolutely the right thing. You know, for me, I don't think you could possibly take a ministerial position if you weren't able to stand up and fight for your constituents even when sometimes that might be not the direction that councillor ministers chooses to go um, so there will always be uh, be things that I think cross cut across whether it be uh, defer and constituency areas which I'll ask Michelle and delegate to her for um, or whether it be councillor ministers I think we all come across that I mean the size of the island I think dictates that will be the case so for me it's about making sure that there's clear processes in place that allow us to do what we are put there for which is both to represent our constituents but also to make sure we're representing the best interests of the Isle of Man. Okay, uh, a note in from Tim uh, just saying regarding schools, uh, we're being told that there are going to be another 15,000 people coming to the Isle of Man. They will include a substantial amount of children. If we have, and you mentioned, I mean, Balakameen is a fine school, but it's got porter cabins and there's nowhere to park there. So is that going to be a good advert for getting new residents to the Isle of Man? And if the schools aren't fit for purpose... Surely we can't wait until the, the, the pupils arrive before, before sorting out the school estate. And I know from talking with uh, Julie Edge that that's absolutely something education are already alert to. Not just um, the projected influx that you may have of children, but also recognising that percentage of those children may have additional educational yeah. needs and making sure we can provide for that. So I know that they're doing some work looking at where capacity sits and trying to do that uh, the work that manages that disconnect because there are spaces in some schools and obviously there are other schools certainly some of the ones within Douglas that are oversubscribed Um, but not necessarily does the uh, the person's location they can find a place to live which of course is often the case rather than where they might want to live it's often where they can find somewhere match up with where a school space might might be available so there is definitely work ongoing in education in that regard and I think it's going to be a big piece of work. Okay Julian you're live with Joni Farragher and Claire Barber. Hi Andy and uh, hello Claire and Joni. Hi Julian. Hi Julian. Hiya. Um, I've got one question for Claire, but uh, I'd like to say a quick thank you to Joni for supporting um, the continued operation of the Southern Swimming Pool. And there are literally thousands of people who think you and your fellow MHKs did the right thing and are not at all disappointed in you. You can uh, be sure of that. Thanks for that, Joni. Yeah. uh, And talking of collaboration, it may not just be just with government people as well, because I was also very impressed with the five-year-old Maisie and her mum, Chloe, who were featured on page seven of last week's Manx Independent newspaper under the heading, Maisie Helps to Secure Pool's Future. And I would have thought Maisie's school teachers and friends must be very proud of her as well. Indeed. Um, my question for Claire is on food security. Um, the noticeable empty food shelves in shops across the island in recent months begs the question, uh, do you have any plans to reintroduce food production on the island, even something like as simple as chicken production, and perhaps maybe making legislation less burdensome on farmers? So it's not something that we've looked at in terms of, uh, I suppose, government compelling something like that to happen there is some degree of poultry uh, farming obviously we know that because we have egg production um, and equally there are there are some uh, people doing turkeys around uh, Christmas time um, but large scale poultry production to my understanding and I don't purport to be a, a chicken farmer um, is, is hugely challenging because of the economies of scale so it's not something that I think has been uh, looked at for some time I did speak to someone recently actually a farmer who had had a brief foray into it Um, and said it just wasn't uh, something that was viable on the Isle of Man. Um, Now, 
whether that's changed I don't know and I do think globally we're seeing a shift in how food production um, and food is valued um, but at the minute we, we're in that uh, interim process where I think for something like poultry and it's maybe it's a not the best example I don't know Julian but um, the, the costs are exceptionally high and I'm not sure whether the people purchasing it would bear those costs and therefore whether that could be a viable business and I think the challenge for government is that how much does government provide in terms of a, a, a s- s- support system I suppose you know do you go on a per chicken basis because we, we have gone down that route with some other things and I think perhaps we get ourselves into a bit of a pickle maybe I think I would say in terms though of our support uh, our, our focus our focus is absolutely on increasing local production um, but I think I would be looking at some of the um, areas where we already have established production to increase that rather than potentially increase in introducing new areas um, and there are some things that we simply are, are unlikely to be able to grow at scale on the Isle of Man um, and we're always competing with costs so when you can you know, yeah. grow something miles away and then ship it here cheaper than we could <coughs> excuse me grow it ourselves do you think yeah, um, challenging do you, do you think inviting one of the world's biggest supermarkets to have a virtual monopoly on the Isle of Man is going to increase local production? I mean, I'm not sure they were invited. I don't know if that's the word I'd use, Andy. I think you're being a bit mischievous, but uh, <laughs> I think the, the, the challenge is that there was a... ShopRite was for sale, and there was someone who came in and purchased it. I'm not aware yeah. that there was a queue of other people looking to purchase ShopRite, um, and that is ultimately a commercial decision. What's absolutely right for us to do now, which is what, is, which is what the officers and the team in DEFRA are doing, is meeting regularly with Tesco's. Tesco's are absolutely saying the right things. You know, they want to want to support local, but equally, Tesco's is a, a large-scale operation, and they want to make sure they have to have stuff on the shelves at a continued standard, at a continued supply, and continued quantities every week. Now, for some of our local producers that's something that's challenging for them because that's not how they've historically worked so when you're a one-man band potentially running a, a business you need to have some time off and if you can't manage your stock to be able to do that those are the bridges we're trying to overcome we've obviously put a support scheme out to make sure that people can get the relevant accreditations they can supply to Tesco should they choose to and should that be right for their business but I think there has to be a point where we say what is and isn't the role of government and that is tricky but I absolutely support us increasing food production and I think as we see scope 3 emissions being considered more and more by companies that transport will start to have a cost that's attributed to it so bringing banana bananas from Brazil will suddenly not just be the cost of putting them on a, on a boat it will be the cost of uh, covering off the emissions for those for example. Uh, uh, yeah. Has the department had ongoing discussions with Tesco? Yeah, yeah. So officers meet. Do you find uh, them easy to talk to? Yeah, I mean, I've chatted myself with the uh, both the Lake Road store manager and the uh, island manager for Tesco's, and I found them to be really open. Okay. Uh, had some great conversations, and absolutely, they want to get our products on the shelves. We've now got to make sure that that works for them. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm glad you, I'm glad you have because we've been trying to get in touch with Tesco's media office since they announced that they bought Shoprite, and they haven't rip re- 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 uh, reply to one of our phone calls or emails so it'd be nice if tesco did julian yeah um you said something interesting about transport um because it seems to me that the legislation in place is trying to lower emissions yet we are shipping food here i mean even if it's not even food i mean you know the idea that we're shipping stuff from say guangzhou uh, in China to Southampton, for example, is an 11,000 mile journey using Panamax ships that use up 15,000 litres of marine diesel an hour. So you can imagine how much that is. Aren't we kind of displacing our emissions elsewhere? Um, would it not be, I mean, just from the pure point of view of just growing our own food so it doesn't have to be trucked all across Europe and all the rest of it? Um, surely that would make more sense. And also, the new boat obviously is having some issues at the moment. Um, and also, when it goes into Liverpool, uh, I was going to ask you this as well. What's going to happen? Because they can't do freight. So is the Arrow going to be leased elsewhere, in which case the Ben will have to be used to bring freight from Haysham each, each uh, overnight sailing? How's that going to work? <laughs> OK, let's just go to Joni first and then to Claire Barber. Um, so obviously this is more of a sort of deaf question, but in terms of what Julian mentioned there about um, emissions um, of, of 
transporting food to such an extensive distance. I, I completely agree. Um, however, I think what we need to bear in mind is, as Claire mentioned there, that it's the cost, it's the financial cost versus the emissions cost, I think, that we're trying to weigh up here. And that's if it's cheaper financially, people will buy it, even if you put a product next to a local product and one is cheaper and one is local, they are going to get the cheaper. That's human nature. I, I, well, yeah, and I think it's difficult to try to get across to people the importance of of supporting your local um, your local farmers, particularly when people are experiencing financial issues themselves yeah. right okay. now. So, Claire Barber? Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I think there it is the balance, and that's why, you know, in in my opinion, I think what we really need to encourage is those people who can afford to buy local, to shop local, acknowledging that for some people that isn't something that's an option for them. Um, and I think that we need to look at where we can increase production that will help with some economies of scale. Um, but I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a position where we're doing the level and scale of farming that we're sometimes trying to compete with. You know, But you know, certainly my family, we, we are in a, a very fortunate position. We are able to buy some of those local pro- products. And I absolutely Absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm happy to support yeah. those local farmers, and I think it's it's right for me to do that. But I've also been in times in my life where that just wasn't something I could do. So I think we all have to acknowledge that uh, it's not for me to tell people they must shop local regardless. We have to make local much more accessible and affordable where we can. But actually, there are plenty of people, as Julian says, who can afford it on the Isle of Man. And I would absolutely encourage those people to make sure we do support local because that allows our farmers to invest perhaps in more equipment to look at different uh, products they might go into producing and we know that there's a great uh, great uh, sort of shelf shelves full um, if you go into some of our, our stores on the Isle of Man and you can see whether it be from uh, a vegetable shop at the side of the road you know we've got some brilliant places where you can go and buy uh, local vegetables local meat um, uh, local eggs and you know all other products I don't want to exclude anyone but okay. um, I, it, absolutely it's the right thing we should we, t- we should be doing is increasing local production but I think we also have to be realistic about how far potentially we can go in that regard. Okay, thanks Julian Thanks very much, cheers. Good to hear from you uh, A note in from Audrey who just said, uh, will milling wheat ever be sown again on the Isle of Man, bearing in mind the position at Laxey Glen Mills and no Ramsey Bakery? So there are contracts in place at the minute and there is milling wheat growing Uh, on the Isle of Man there are some people who are still in the position where they can export and there is some that's being taken into Laxey Glen Mills obviously we've seen uh, the recent news where Robinsons um, have bought Ross Bakery and actually Robinsons are clearly putting a huge investment in around bakery provision on the Isle of Man I think that's a really exciting story Um, so yeah I absolutely think we will see more milling wheat growing because I think there is a demand for it so again keep buying bread if you can keep buying the the Laxey flour I think again great product and we should be really selling, selling that that's a good news story. Live today with the Douglas East MHKs between now and one. Call, text, email and WhatsApp. Located in Upper Douglas, Woodburn House offers an elegant, one-of-a-kind space to host your unforgettable event. Celebrate your love story and say I do to Woodburn House. Our 2024 wedding diary is now open and our wedding planner is here to take care of every element of your perfect day and make your dream wedding a reality. Woodburn House. Visit woodburnhouse.im or call 888300. That's 888300. Drive smarter, drive more reliable, drive a great deal at Man in Motors. With a superb range of cars for every budget, always available. And if we don't have it, we'll source it. Plus, servicing, valeting and prestige detailing too. Man in Motors, Richmond Hill, Douglas. Find us on Facebook or call 420 420. That's 420 420. Drive a better bargain at Man in Motors. When it comes to money, rainy days happen to us all. If you'd like to save for a rainy day, choose your local Manx Credit Union, where your savings stay in the local economy and go towards helping families and island residents on their own rainy days. Visit Manx Credit Union Peel Road and find our newly extended opening hours online at mcu.im. Save with the Manx Credit Union. Every bit of savings really does make a difference. Manx Credit Union is licensed by the Isle of Man Financial Services Authority. Plum Master, we plumber shop. For supplies, we've got the lot. Ramsey Douglas, come on down. Plum Master, the best around. 
Gas boilers, pipes and taps Bathroom fitting, stylish rats Plum Master have all in store And deliver to your door For trade and DIY plumbing supplies Visit Plum Master at Haldane Fisher in Douglas and Ramsey Plum Master, your local, reliable, competitive plumbing supplier this Tuesday at 6 o'clock here on Manx Radio, join Kiri Kermode and Simon Clark for Countryside. We hear from a couple more people that I caught up with at the Plower Match over in Bolliger last week. I talked to Central Mart's auctioneer and farmer Peter Quayle about his acceptance of the role of captain of the parish of Maloo. And also I caught up with Tamsin Kermode from Little Meadow Farm in Jerby, who were one of the newbies at the Ramsey Farmer's Market. That's all in Countryside Tuesday here on Manx Radio at 6 o'clock. And don't forget... You can download and subscribe to the podcast for free at manxradio.com. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. And Joni Farragher and Claire Barber, MHKs, elected for Douglas East. And James with us. Hi, James. Hello. And hello, Claire and Joni. Hi, Um, James. I want... I wanted to raise two points with you, and I'll be as quick as I can. Um, Now our minimum wage is lower than the UK minimum wage, and it's not good enough when you consider the cost of living here is higher. And I think it's a bit disappointing that the minimum wage committee can't make a decision and make a recommendation to government. It's not on because people are struggling here. And which leads me to the second point. There is a housing shortage on the Isle of Man and everybody talks about, oh, let's have so many private sector houses and all the rest of it. But the problem we've got is there is a shortage of local authority housing or council housing here, which should be not-for-profit housing for the vulnerable. And so that leads me to say this. There are a lot of young people on this island who are going to end up in jobs where they will never, ever be able to afford to buy their own home. And they will be thrown, basically, to some of the unscrupulous landlords we've got on the Isle of Man. What's your views? Okay. Hi, James. Thanks for the questions. Um, so in terms of the minimum wage, uh, I do absolutely agree with you that, um, we, you know, we, we we need to get that minimum wage set. Uh, we're not actually behind the UK in terms of the fact that their minimum wage is simply set before ours for the next financial year. We haven't set ours for the next financial year. So ours isn't lower at the moment. It just isn't set. And it won't. I'm, I'm fairly confident it won't be lower. Manx Labour Party position remains that the minimum wage and the living wage should be aligned this year. And um, our member in Treasury is, you know, has released um, statements on this recently and uh, as has the Manx Labour Party. And that is our firm view that... And I I would personally urge the Treasury Minister and the DfE Minister to make a decision without the input of the Minimum Wage Committee if they can't actually get their um, recommendation in place in time. Yes, I mean, the Minimum Wage Committee, I think, have said they want to go out and get some research about the impact on businesses. Um, and I can understand where they're coming from. But, I mean, I would I would agree that, you know, for me, the minimum wage should be at a point where it's a living wage. If, if we're acknowledging that's what you need to live, then that seems to make sense that that would be the minimum. Um, and I have supported throughout the alignment of that and the, the need to move the minimum wage up until we get to a point where we only have a living wage. Um, but as Joni said, it's not that we're behind. It's that process that now needs to take place. Um, I'm I'm not sure what happens. I assume the minimum wage committee have to make a recommendation um, and I, w- I would expect that to be coming, I would hope, soon. But obviously the, the piece of work that they've requested happens now. Um, I, I don't know how long they would envisage that might take. Um, public sector housing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely public sector housing is, is part of that whole housing picture. Um, the private sector housing that we're seeing being developed is having to be done at a price that they are getting the returns that they want for their business. Um, and we're seeing houses go up that are exceptionally expensive. And as you say, realistically, for many people, will never be affordable. Um, so we do need uh, additional public sector housing as well. Um, and that's where some of the projects that we're seeing Manx Development Corporation work on actually are looking at making sure we have that allocation um, that's freed up to the public sector um, portfolio. Um, and I know that one of the other pieces of work that the Housing Communities Committee um, are, are looking at, again, is is making sure that we're, we're bringing properties that are already there back into use because I think as much as we can build new properties we know that the construction costs have gone up we know that availability of labour in the construction sector has become an issue so I think there is a benefit where we can to making sure that we're keeping all the housing stock that we already have in good use. And what about dilapidated private properties? Properties that look like 
like um, the Adams family live inside them. And uh, we all know where they are. We see mm. them day to day and nothing seems to get done about them. And those are the ones, I suppose, some of the ones I'm talking about. You know, they're either ones where people lock up and leave and the houses just sit empty or they're the ones that you know, are absolutely uh, dilapidated in the conventional yeah. sense of the word. And not only are those houses then not being used, but they're also causing damage to people in neighbouring properties. And that's uh, certainly something I've had a number of times in Douglas East that's incredibly frustrating to someone who is investing in their property yeah. when because someone else's roof or guttering is damaged it's causing water ingress to their property that's totally outside of their control so what, what can government do about it or what can douglas council do about it surely so can, I, can i just raise the issue just this just respond to this in terms of the poverty report because it does have recommendations that are, that are relevant to this issue so first of all that um the recommendation two in there that the council of ministers has uh, commits to the number of public sector houses to be built each year from here into 2041 um but equally that um Sorry, I'm just trying to read the recommendation here in order to get it correct. Um, but yeah, so that, that's I, I'll just leave it at that. Though we do have recommendations in there to address this issue in terms of the fact that we should we should have a plan actually as to how many re- new homes we need, both in terms of the private sector and public sector homes. And we haven't, and that's really crucial. So I think in terms of James's question, actually getting that figure from the Council of Ministers in a plan. And people from the, and people will be saying, Journey Farragher, you know, there are recommendations. There are what politicians would like to happen. But when's a brick going to be laid? Absolutely, that's the question. And it's down to uh, the Poverty Committee members, it's down to All About Benches to actually... uh have effective scrutiny around that and to be able to ensure that they hold the government the government to account. That's why we've included our recommendation that the Council of Ministers actually draw up a plan to implement the um, recommendations of the previous Poverty Committee which haven't been implemented and that is why we've included that and we need to we need to be effectively holding the government to account for the resolutions that have been passed by Tim Wald. James? Yeah, well I'd just like to make another point if I may. It certainly hasn't helped Tim Krukall uh, increasing the council house rents by 7.5%, which is above the, uh, the present rate of inflation. Now, I know those on, on Social Security will have their rents paid for them, but once again, those people that are earning just a bit too much to claim benefits, but not enough to call themselves well paid, they're going to be hit again. And 7.5%, to be honest with you, I think is draconian. And uh, despite what Tim Krukel told Tim Wolf said it was fair, that man has no idea what fairness is because he doesn't have to live on the sort of wages or pensions that we have to. Okay, all right, we appreciate that. James, thanks for calling today. Uh, I just want to also just uh, put this to you, uh, Claire Barber and Joni Farragher. When we say that young people have no chance, and and it's very easily said, but we hear it, have no chance of ever owning a home. Surely that's going to breed frustration, possibly despair, possibly even resentment from young Manx kids who may just pack up and leave and and would anybody blame them Claire Barber and I think unquestionably it has become harder and harder for people to to get the initial deposit together actually is hard you know I hear frequently pe- the the, the um, position people find themselves in is that the mortgage would actually be cheaper than the rent they're paying and the, because they're paying a higher rent they're not in a position to be able to save yeah. to get um, an actual mortgage because they haven't got a deposit so I think the banks are demanding higher um, deposits I think that's become a, a significant uh, block for people I think there's a number of things that have come together both the increase in prices of properties the increase in rental um, levels that are being charged the increase then in the gas and the electricity that you would be paying against it the the fact that wages I I think it's a perfect storm I think we really are seeing and I don't think it's just here so I think you know it's not just the Isle of Man that's experiencing this there are pockets where it's easier but there are still significant number of places I'm aware of um, certainly across uh, the United Kingdom where they're experiencing a similar situation Uh, Joni Farragher anything government can do about this? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there definitely is an issue of intergenerational fairness that's been raised, I think, multiple times when I was on the doorstep canvassing over the election campaign. And I do, um, to a degree, agree with Claire there that it's an issue that's actually experienced across the piece, really. It's not just an Isle of Man specific issue. Um, I think 
we need to ensure that our young people's voices are heard and I think that's kind of maybe maybe the missing link here that um, a lot of our policies are framed around older generations because that is the generation of turn up to the polls and it's really really important that we motivate young people to get to the polls in the next general election and I cannot emphasise that strongly enough we need to hear their voices we need to get them engaged in politics so that we can create the future that they need OK live with Claire Barber and Joni Farragher on Man in Line Find a hidden gem in the Isle of Man the Abbey Restaurant Balasala this old country house offers a relaxed and sophisticated atmosphere where you can wind down with unique and interesting fresh food and drinks from dinner with fine wines to tea and exquisite cakes Enjoy our fantastic lunch menu with fresh specials or join us for afternoon tea and dinner. To book, click the abbey.im, find the Abbey on Facebook or call 822-393. When you save a little money, it means a lot these days. If you're looking for bathrooms and tiles, you'll always find something new in store at Pacesetter. For surprisingly affordable prices and excellent choice, search online for Pacesetter Douglas. Or better still, visit the Pacesetter bathroom and tile showroom on Harris Terrace and see the new styles in store. You can get the best of everything where the price is twice as nice. Oh, problems with your spine and posture can have a serious effect on your quality of life, but a Line for Life Spine Clinic could help. If you're suffering from back pain, neck pain, headaches, their holistic scientific approach could find and treat the root cause of the problem for long-lasting relief. Whew. Touch Align for Life now or call 629 4 Align for Life, the island's spine and posture clinic, here to make life better. You'll find a real home away from home behind the big wall on Grovemount South in Ramsey. Grovemount Residential Home promotes independent living where residents can come and go as they wish in our homely environment. Our professional service includes respite, long-term residential living and other care options. Call in for a cup of tea and a chat. We're opposite the Ramsey Group Practice or call 812-173. Isle of Man Registered Charity Number 108. Grovemount Residential Home. Professionalism. Dignity. Care. The Man in Line with Andy Wint. After Man in Line today, we're in our 60th anniversary year, of course, and uh, John Moss is going to be looking back in 2004, the revelation that the MEA had taken out unauthorised loans. That's after Man in Line today with Joni Farragher and Claire Barber and uh, the youth committee you were telling me about, uh, Claire Barber. Yeah, so one of the, the new concepts that's been brought in uh, through Tim Ward is a Tim Ward youth committee, so ages 15 to 24, um, and they uh, members have uh, been chosen on that they they are going to sit they will be exactly as any other Timor committee they'll be able to take evidence from ministers take evidence from the people who are at the head of that field and the topic they've picked is housing so I think absolutely as Joni said it's really important we hear the youth voice and I think we're going to have a really good opportunity through that committee and then they will report and Tim Ward will debate that so there's a really great avenue so I would imagine they would be submitting a call for evidence so I would encourage anyone with thoughts on this topic whether they be young people who are in that situation whether they be parents of young people who can uh, who have concerns wait till that call for evidence comes um, and I'm sure we'll both publicise that when it does and, and get the submissions in OK thanks for being with us today uh, it, we, I got through about 10% of the questions as always uh, but thanks to uh, Journey Farragher and Claire Barber will you come back again later on this year? We will do Andy so we'll we maybe will, get Andy. through the rest of the questions sure. or some of them <laughs> back with another open line tomorrow on Manx Radio and on Wednesday Rob Cowell Ramsey Commissioner Rob Cowell Deputy Chair of Ramsey Commissioners Lead Member for Finance General Purposes and Establishment on Wednesday and on Thursday another Ramsey Commissioner but this time in her position as leader of the Green Party Lamara Crane is on Thursday but back with an open line tomorrow thanks to Chris Quirk on the phones today enjoy the rest of your Monday W-I-N-T 60 years serving you as the nation station. This is Manx Radio. It was a bombshell totalling £120 million and it was exploded on Manx Radio's weekend politics programme. The year was 2004. On the programme was Treasury Minister Alan Bell and MHK David Cannon. Mr Cannon managed to get an admission from Mr Bell 
that the Manx Electricity Authority under its chief executive Mike Profit had taken out unauthorised loans to fund the new natural gas-powered power station at Pool Rose, that on top of £185 million the Treasury had handed over. The admission shook the financial foundations of the island. All this came rather out of the blue this morning. We were waiting for questions. Instead, we got a motion from Martin Quayle, Middle MHK, which asked that at 2.30 this afternoon, the Treasury Minister should make a statement on the MEA situation. After some toing and froing over whether a statement should be read and by whom, Richard Corkill said talks had been going on with some urgency for the last few weeks, when the situation over the loan, unapproved by the Treasury, it seems, came to light. He also said the Treasury Minister had been asked some very direct questions on Manx Radio. It would have been wrong of him not to answer them, and that's how this figure of 120 millions came out. The tight questioning on Manx Radio that forced this into public was touched upon by Mr Bell. Also the hectic work behind the scenes. Mr Speaker, the uh, discussions with the MEA and my offices have been intense over the last three weeks and have really taken up pretty well all my senior officers' time to try and get to the root of uh, a number of issues which uh, um, uh, have been thrown up. It had been claimed that rumours of the financial situation at the MEA had been known in the corridors for some weeks. Why? Challenged Mr Cannon Member for Michael, did the Chief Minister not make a statement earlier? What was wrong with him making a statement to the House last week before it was forcibly extracted uh, in, in a radio show from the, uh, from the Treasury Minister? If it was good enough to be extracted on Sunday, it was surely good enough and more appropriate to be informed to this House last Tuesday. The Chief Minister told members that an independent firm of accountants were being appointed to look into the affairs at the MEA and he did admit his government was pretty much in the dark at the moment to the same extent as members of the public and indeed members of Tinwald. The government has a duty when coming forward with statements to ensure that what we say is, is, is what we know and I'm afraid there are not too many things that we know at this point. Part of Island Life for 60 years. This is your Manx Radio.